So thanks for coming. Um, we have a, a couple of introductory slides from our College of Global Futures careers team. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide. I'd love to. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, do you want to introduce your team? Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline. I'm the Director of Career Services, Internships, and Alumni Engagement for the College of Global Futures. And I just wanted to take the opportunity to introduce you to our office and to our services. So um, Mary and Christina are our career development specialists. They meet one on one with students. We also do lots of events um, related to professional development. We have taken over the SOS 231 intro to sustainability careers course. So we do a little bit of career development type of things um, there. Allison manages mentorship. Um, and alumni. So we have a couple great mentorship programs that I would uh, love for you to apply for. You can schedule appointments with us online or in person. Um, and if we could go to the next slide. I wanted to make sure to let you know about Career Exploration Day. It is November 13th. It is our big event and we really need people to be there. We're having about 20 employers come. We need a good turnout. Employers will only continue to come visit us if we have people that show. So I'm really kind of pushing this one of, you know, kind of begging for people to come. So please come, bring yeah. your friends. It's open to everyone. So that means all majors at ASU. So uh, we encourage everyone to attend. The yeah, last, last and it's a amazing. great event. So don't stand back yet. It's a great yeah, event. It is. And the turnout was amazing. It was. Yeah, it was. And we just want to have that uh, again for this year. So yeah, you can see there exactly basically what it's going to be like, even expanded a little bit this year. So the other thing is... I'm going to go very old school on you oh. and see if you would like to <laughs> sign up for a voluntary message from me one to two times a month. Not allowed to do a news newsletter, but I am allowed to get people who are interested in getting an update about career services. So if you would like to receive that, please sign up. That way you don't miss anything. There is so much going on that it's hard to go to one place and find everything. So I'll do like a summary, like... October, this is what's happening. Like, here's the career stuff you should be interested in go to. So, um, yeah, and that's it for me. I've already signed up. Yeah, this. you're getting it anyway. Um, I am just going to go ahead and put in a plug. We are so fortunate to have our career services team. Um, a lot of places here at ASU, you have to just go to ASU career services. And while they are great, they can't provide the same kind of specialized connections, internships, and things like that that we can provide here in the School of Sustainability. Plus, um, I've worked with them for a long time now, and they are really fantastic at getting your documents into shape and things like that. If you're doing a lot of applications and you're not seeing a lot of response, take your materials to Career Services because they know all the tricks to make sure that you can actually get yourself noticed by employers and that's going to have a lot to do with your success on the job market. Okay. Uh, there was one question in the chat yes. about whether um, these events will be available for online students. There are a lot of events that are available for online students, but I can't say that all of the career events will be. So for example, Career Exploration Day, it's pretty much an in-person event. It's tables and it's kind of your traditional career fair. But I would say most of our events, we do try to do in a hybrid uh, fashion. So we, have, we do have lots of opportunities for people who are online to participate. If they are local, but they're online students, would they be able to come? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so the answer there was sure, absolutely. Also, um, um, just how to LinkedIn. You, you are an online student who's not local. That doesn't mean you can't contact all the alumni that are manning the, that are at the tables. Um, and so connecting with Caroline anyway, and then getting a list of all the, the people who are going to be there, it might even be a better way to just send a direct message to someone at the table. And because um, you can see there were lines last year. This was the most attended, like most vibrant event. Um, and so there are different kinds of interactions you can have. And maybe if you're an online student who can't be at the, at the event in person, you can still benefit from meeting the same people that the people in person will meet. Hey, Jana, staying on topic. Yep. Your last, 
question is whether people who are online in this session, how they should sign up to get information. That's a great question. I was thinking about that. I don't know if they want to put their name in the chat and I can get that from you or if I should just have them email me directly. I want to make it as easy as possible for them. So is there an option on the registration to indicate mm -hmm. that you want to get information about this, but that you're not able to attend in person? That was not on the RSVP for this. No. Okay. All right. We'll we'll make sure that we get you there. Yeah. We might send out a follow-up email to everybody who attended. That's a good idea. Or signed up saying yeah. that if you want to sign up with um, career services, this is how to do it. Yes. Perfect. Like All right. It's not a mic. Sounds like it, it's an is. It's, it's an is. is. Yeah. yeah. So we will do that mm -hmm. and we will uh, send out the um, a link to the recording too. All right. All right. So if I could have Chris and uh, Joe join me up here at the table. Where you want to sit? You guys go ahead and sit here. Okay, you can sit here. I'll sit on the corner. All right. And um, if I could Hi, go Joe. ahead and start with you two introducing yourselves and then we'll go to Jana. I'm Chris Boone. I'm a professor in the School of Sustainability. I recognize some of you because you took my SOS 232 Professional Skills and Sustainability course. Glad to see you here. I was formerly the Dean of the School of Sustainability and the founding Dean of the College of Global Futures. And since stepping down from that role, one of the things that I'm particularly driven by is how do we make sure that we meet the demand gap right now for sustainability and green jobs. We have more green jobs, sustainability jobs, than we have qualified students building. And um, so that's good news, but the bad news is that means that, there's, uh, that there is opportunities that are not being filled. And if we wanna meet the challenges that we all care about, I think we need to have people in these positions that are working on these issues 40 hours a week, not thinking about them 10 minutes a day. So I'm thrilled by any opportunity that we might have to help you be successful because you're gonna make the impact uh, as an army of sustainability professionals that we, we really need. That's it. You want to introduce Jana? Uh, sure. Jana, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jana Goebel. I'm Assistant Professor of Sustainability Education in, in the College of Global Futures School of Sustainability. And I'm really excited to talk to you today about how we use LinkedIn uh, because I see that it's changing and I like to demystify feelings of unease around it. So I'm really glad that we can talk about things like personal branding and how to make connections and try and make it feel more accessible to anyone who came to this today. Like, I don't want to do that. I don't know how to do that. And I will say that Jana really did want to join us in person, but unfortunately Jana got COVID and she doesn't want to give it to anyone else. Yes. But also um, I get to see the people online and really like I get to see their faces. So that's fun. And I'm excited about that. Um, so it's, it's okay to be hybrid and we've figured this out after a couple of years. Yes. All right, and Joe. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Joe Dobrow. I am a professor of practice here in the School of Sustainability. And the reason that it is a professor of practice is because my background really is all in the for-profit sector. Uh, and that's the perspective that I'm bringing to this uh, panel conversation today. So I was the chief marketing officer for Whole Foods. I was the chief marketing officer for Sprouts Farmers Market. Uh, for Discovery Channel, for various uh, companies in the sports arena. So I've spent many, many, many a day looking at LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. candidates for jobs that I had posted, uh, trying to figure out how to utilize LinkedIn as an employer. And there's one other part of my background I think that's particularly relevant here, and that is that about 13 years ago, because of my background in the natural and organic foods industry, I started an organization called Embark, M-B-A-R-K. And Embark is dedicated to trying to connect the food industry with mostly graduate students from all over the country. And so I've worked with students from 65 different universities around the country, trying to find those people who have very sort of progressive uh, attitudes about the workplace and who can use the skills that they're gaining at the graduate level in an industry that badly needs them. And so over the years, we've convened many, many events with Embark. Uh, we've had more than a thousand graduate students go through our programs and lots of people from 
uh, the industry who did not have graduate degrees, but who sort of wanted to be a part of this as well. And so LinkedIn has also been a critical part of that because I've used LinkedIn as a recruitment tool to bring people to those Embark events. And we've talked about LinkedIn a lot with hiring managers at panels that we've done at Embark events. So glad to have everybody here and online as well. And uh, I will turn it back over to Ivy. All right. So this is primarily intended to be a panel discussion with Q&A, but before we get to that part, I just wanna share some facts about LinkedIn that gives you an idea of why this is such an important and far-reaching tool. Can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. um, so right now, if you look at LinkedIn, there are almost a billion users worldwide. Now, not all of those people are active. A lot of people use LinkedIn inefficiently like I do, right? I have my resume on there. I have a bunch of contacts. I'm happy to facilitate connections between people, but I'm not out there really actively seeking contacts. Um, I'm really not using it to its most potential. And so that's kind of why- You're really selling it. <laughs> no, I'm not. And, and what I'm saying though is that if don't think, oh God, I'm one of a billion people. If you're using it well, you're part of an elite group of people on LinkedIn who are actually taking advantage of all that it has to offer. So there are all these new registrations every day. And I think one of the things I hear a lot from, at least from undergraduate students, is they think LinkedIn is kind of old school that like young people don't use it. But if you take a look, the highest number of users on LinkedIn is actually in the range of 25 to 34. Young professionals are using LinkedIn to connect to people who can facilitate their employment road ahead. Um, and, and I would also yeah. just add to that, that uh, the, the old people who are using LinkedIn, those are all the employers that you want to talk to. <laughs> They're all on it. They're all using it. It is your resume to them. Yeah, and yeah. so it can be a really good tool. Um, there is an interesting statistic on here that Joe has some additions to, which is that every minute 9,000 users apply for jobs and seven people are hired. Um, but as an employer, he had a really interesting perspective on that. Yeah, this is a great little story. So at one of the Embark events, I had a, an MBA student from uh, UC Davis who came. And after the event was over, a few months later, he was graduating. And he reached out to me and he said, hey, do you know anybody at the company Olipop? Okay, some of you, I'm sure, know Olipop. You know, it's like a, a probiotic, probiotic soda company, really hot brand. Uh, and so they had posted a job on LinkedIn for a chief of staff, which was an MBA graduate student appropriate position, really good comp, north of $200,000. Um, and he was interested in trying to crack through there because what he saw when he went on to LinkedIn was that there had been 1,800 applicants. And he figured, I don't have a shot in hell at getting seen, but maybe Joe knows somebody at the company. I did not know anybody directly at Olipop, but I did know the company that does recruiting for them. And so in maybe two days time, I reached out to that company. But by the time I did that, there were now more than 5,000 applicants for that job. But that's just what you think it says on LinkedIn. It tells you 5,000 applicants. That is not actually the way the algorithm works on LinkedIn. If you click on the apply, uh, button, but you don't go any further. The counter uh, uh, moves up by one. If you start part of the way down the funnel and you begin filling out the application, but you abandon it, that counts toward their total count. And so I had employers who told me, look, uh, I'll see a job that I posted on LinkedIn and it'll say there's 250 applicants. But when I go into the employer portal of the applicant tracking system behind the scenes, I'll maybe only see 30 or 40 actual applications in there. So don't be dissuaded by the fact that it looks like there's a ton of applicants on there. It's not a real statistic. However, the information that Ivy shared with you is really important here. It, this is the marketplace for a lot of jobs. And so many, many people now have abandoned sort of the traditional system of asking applicants to send in paper or to email, and they're doing everything through LinkedIn. So it's a very, very hot marketplace. 
whether you believe the actual numbers on there or not and don't get dissuaded by them, uh, is this is the place that you should be going to look for good jobs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, oh, and Jana's got a note. Uh, yes. No, I'm just uh, managing the chat over here. So one of the questions that came up is, do we need to be LinkedIn premium members? And we know that's a common question and we plan to answer that as a panel today, but I just wrote in the chat that there's a 30-day trial that's free, and we'll talk about this further at a different part of the presentation, but um, but there's 30-day trial, and you can use it in a strategic moment, and um, we'll talk about it later. All right, so yeah, let's move on to the next slide. And these are some of the reasons that LinkedIn matters and some of the ways that you can use it to advance your career. So obviously networking, creating and maintaining connections, having that web of people to say, you know what, I don't know somebody at Olipop, but I know somebody who might know somebody at Olipop and they don't know somebody at Olipop, but they know the recruiter for Olipop. And so creating that kind of web, the more quality connections you have, the better your web is going to be. Um, personal branding is another thing that you can do. And Jana is probably our expert on that. Did you wanna talk about that for a second, Jana? Sure, just real quickly. Um... I love when you use LinkedIn in your own voice, whatever that means to you. So for example, I wear pink to conferences and I got branded as the pink professor. And this happened because I was at Old Navy and I was trying on a pink suit and I kind of like sheepishly said to the person working the dressing room, I was like, can I do this? And she goes, yes, it's your Elle Woods moment. And then I felt my, my posture change like, yes, I can do this. So I bought this like hundred dollar pink suit at Old Navy. I wore it to a conference and then I said something kind of controversial in a session and someone said, the pink professor, I wanted to talk to you about what you said. And I was like, this is brilliant. So now when I have an important day, I wear pink and that way um, people are like, oh, someone's here in front of me. you know. <laughs> and and so I've, now when I go to conferences, if I wear my pink pants, someone will be like, I met you last year. There you are. And I turned it into my personal branding. Um, and then I use LinkedIn in my own voice and I talk about things that that matter to me, but I have a scope of what I'm comfortable sharing and what I don't feel like sharing on LinkedIn. And so for you, whatever that is, if it's only commenting on other people's posts or um, posting once every couple months, but having it be you, um, then I think that helps because there's a very, very big difference between saying I had a Department of Energy internship and here's a picture of me with 30 other interns and we had a department of energy in energy internship. So then when you think about it as a resume, like you're seeing a visual story of what you did and it's more memorable. Um, so if you think about it like that, then it's your personal reputation and what you've been working on. And um, for example, in the picture of career exploration day, I know exactly where I am because I'm wearing a pink shirt at that. And I can see myself in that aerial image of that event. Uh, and then people feel more comfortable approaching me because they maybe feel like they know me a little bit more. And, um, and I think it's been great. And so that hundred dollar pink suits worth like thousands of dollars to me now for all the connections it's helped me make and um, the conferences I've gone to and the confidence it gives me. So whatever your pink suit is, I hope you find it. And I think, you know, that's just a reminder too, that using LinkedIn is a long game. It's a way to track your achievements for yourself and for employers. Um, and, it's a way to develop who you are in that sort of marketplace. But Janet has a really good point about using LinkedIn in your own voice, um, sharing the things that are important to you. And one of the things she's also talked about is that the more you engage with the things that are important to you, the more you see the things that are important to you. Um, it can curate your feed in the same way as any other kind of social media thing. So by engaging with things that are important to you, you start to see the opportunities that will work for you. Um, obviously you can't, uh, have jobs for people to search if companies aren't posting jobs. So candidate search is another really important part. Um, and then using it as preparation, um, for research between, for interviews and events. Do you want to talk about how you use it that way? Yeah. Uh, I mean, both as a job seeker and as a hiring manager, uh, it's sort of the first stop for me. Um, I, I combine LinkedIn with a website that's called hunter.io. I don't mm -hmm. know if anybody's ever heard of this, but hunter.io is a, is a free website that allows you to really go and find the, the specific email address of people in different companies. 
sometimes it can be really hard to figure out, to crack, what's the email domain for this company? Like if I wanted to, if I found out about a job on LinkedIn and I decided I'm going to bypass LinkedIn or I'm going to supplement my application on LinkedIn by trying to reach out directly to the hiring manager, how do I figure out what the hiring manager's email address is? Because it may not be included in that LinkedIn ad. Hunter.io is a good way to be able to figure that out. Uh, I've also found, you know, as any sort of, good internet researcher has that if you dig hard enough, it's often the case that the, the, the uh, a person who works in a company, a hiring manager in HR, a talent acquisition person, probably at some point has posted their email address. It may have been part of a PowerPoint presentation that's now online, et cetera. But wh whatever it is, I always try to combine that direct contact with a LinkedIn contact to just sort of break through uh, the crowd a little bit, break through the noise. I mean, you've all heard the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And that is the basic power of LinkedIn because when you're looking at positions at companies and organizations, it'll show you people that you have connections to existing. And then if you go and click on those, it can show you other people that might actually have connections to people you already know. So getting some advice a letter, a recommendation from someone who's part of your LinkedIn community can filter you up in the application file. Yeah, and it's a great point that Chris makes. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, in many views of LinkedIn and many screens, you'll see this little thing pop up next to it that says more profiles for you. So if I clicked on, let's go back to Olipop, if I clicked on the profile of somebody from Olipop, Often what will pop up next to that are more people from Olipop or more people who used to work at Olipop. And so that's the algorithm doing the networking for you, sort of figuring out how you're going to connect the dots, which is an extremely powerful tool. I mean, I, I often refer to this as the side door strategy. Like most of you are at a point in your careers where the, the next job, maybe the next job after that that you find, it's not necessarily going to come from an ad that gets posted, but it's going to come through your networking efforts. And hence, don't try to go in through the front door of a company, especially if it's a big company, because it's hard to get in there and it's hard to figure out how to navigate your way through. Go in through the side door. It's exactly what Ivy said before. You know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else. Uh, at this company, and LinkedIn is the tool that helps you figure that out. So make contact with somebody who works in the company, reach out to them, talk to them, set up a coffee, set up a Zoom call with them, whatever it is, but get on their radar through that means so that when that company is in the hiring process and they're dealing with 1,800 resumes or they just can't find the person that they want, they kind of look around sometimes and say, well, who do we know? Oh, you know, there's that that woman that we uh, that we had contact with uh, through somebody who works in sales. Even better, look for alumni from the School of Sustainability well, because they're going to be particularly interested in helping. Yeah, yeah Carol? and I just wanted to mention on the topic to don't forget us as staff yeah. and faculty to connect with, especially if you're trying to grow your networks. But in the same vein that they were just talking about, we often get contacted by faculty or employers who say, do you know a student who's interested in X, Y, Z? And they say, well, I know a lot of students, but I can only recommend the students that I actually know or am connected with in some way. So you need to be able to be found. And sometimes I'll even push back and say, okay, well, I can blast it out. No, no, don't blast it out. Just send me your recommendations. Not kidding, it happens all the time to all of us. So I wanted to emphasize that as well, that, how that, it's important to know us. Am I working in sustainability? Nope, but I know a lot of people who are. I know who's hiring. <laughs> I'm waiting right now for Sprouts to send me a job that they're getting all ready to post yes. and hasn't even been posted yet. <laughs> yeah. so, and, Justin, and Justin has reached out to me on that as well and said, hey, we're going to have this uh, this job description ready to go. And mm -hmm. if there's any students that you know in your class or through Embark, you know, please let me know. That's the way that it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you that that's especially true in my experience in like the natural and organic foods industry, because this, this is an industry that's really bad at planning ahead. 
If, if, if we were to reach out today to General Mills and say, how many graduate students are you going to hire next year? They know. They know how many heads, what the budget is, what the roles are, what people they're going to bring into rotational programs. They understand that. Sprouts doesn't. Most of the companies in the natural foods industry don't know until the job is upon them. And so it's at that point that they're reaching out to career services where they're reaching out to me and saying, hey, we've got a really important role. It's coming up fast. Who do you know? Can you send some candidates to me? If you send me a request to connect, I will connect with you. Same. I never and I have, I think, 2,600 connections. So that's a lot of people, including their connections. So if you do nothing else, connect with me today. Yeah. Chris, I bet they already have had, I have like three people that have already added me during this session, which is amazing. Um, Ivy, is this a good place for me to talk about my kind of philosophy on direct messaging and, and then education? Or I know we're halfway through our time. Let's let's go directly to that. Okay. One thing I did want you to mention, though, is how you use it to prepare for conferences real quick. Sure. Yep. So um, conferences are expensive and um, crowded and hectic. And so um, in the last few years, we've started using conferencing apps and they become available like pretty early on, maybe two months before the event. Um, and so I use that app and try and add people to my network from who is attending that conference way before the conference. I find a lot of people in the icebreaker section of that app. So there's like this strange, it's uh, the app is called Whova and that's commonly used for conferences. And there's this icebreaker that you can post. And sometimes people post really interesting things. And then I'll say, oh, I'm a dancer too. Then I'll go find them on LinkedIn. Then I'll send them a direct message. Then if there's someone I really want to talk to, I'll say, let's connect before or after the conference um, so that you're not pressurizing that conference to make all of your networking happen in two days in those conditions. And so I usually end up adding like 30 people to my network every conference, which is unheard of in the traditional way we used to do things. And it's it happens in the month before and the two weeks after. Usually the momentum is gone by three weeks after a conference, but in the lead up to it, there's a lot of excitement. So I use the app to find the, the participants and I'll send a message like, hey, I'm going to be at that conference. L love to follow your work and just leave it there. So it's pretty easy to do and a good use of the amount of money you're investing in that event. And yeah, like she said, that's when premium could be useful because a lot of times they'll have a free 30-day uh, trial for LinkedIn premium. You sign up for it. Uh, you use it in and around your conference. You can add as many people as you want. You can send all the direct messages that you want. At the end of the 30 days, you cancel it. And in about six months, you'll get another offer. Um, Which is when you're graduating and looking for a job. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you can use it strategically and not have to pay for it, which I thought was a really good piece of advice. And what's the benefit of premium? What's the benefit of premium? Yeah. Is that, is that the question? One, one of the main things about premium is that it allows you to see everybody who has viewed your profile. LinkedIn is a little cagey about this. They will usually sort of dangle this in front of you. They'll tempt you. They'll occasionally send you an email and say, see who's been looking at your profile. Uh, because depending on how you have the settings set up in your LinkedIn profile, typically it defaults to open access. Meaning if, if you go and look at uh, somebody else's profile, unlike let's say on Facebook, um, that person can see that you've been looking at them. Now you can turn that off uh, if you want to, but with LinkedIn premium, you can see all of that. Uh, you can see sort of all of the activity that's been going on. And it also allows you to reach out uh, easily and directly, although the, this is changing a little bit, to people who are outside of your immediate LinkedIn uh, network. Um, so there is value in LinkedIn premium, but I think Jenna's point is exactly right on that. Use it strategically. Um, you don't need to pay for it. They do offer enough free trials of it. And I'll sometimes even... Uh, sign up using different email addresses so that I can go from one to the next one. I've got a lot of email addresses. I would say that the main benefit of LinkedIn Premium is the ability to send many messages to unknown contacts. And that can be really helpful when you're trying to broaden your network in an industry that you're trying to break into. So when you feel ready to grow your network rapidly, that's when you want to use LinkedIn Premium because um, you can send more messages to unknown people. But 
there's an option when you're connecting with someone to personalize the invite. And that's usually enough because you're not really asking for anything of them. Your personalized invite is, um, I'm interested in oceans and looking forward to following your work here. And that's it. Like, you don't have to ask anything. You don't have to say like, this is what I'm doing. And this is what I'm excited about. It's just like, saw like last night, I read an article and two people were cited in it. And I said, was reading this article last night, looking forward to following your updates on here. And already one of them has accepted the invite. And now that curates my feed so that more people doing that work will show up on my feed. I also make a point to like and comment on a lot of different posts and that curates it too. So that's that's another way you can connect with someone without asking to connect. You can look at people who are doing work that you like and comment on their their posts for a while. And then after a while, when you hit connect, they'll be like, oh, I recognize this name because this person's been commenting on my post. So you don't need LinkedIn Premium to send messages unless you're about to rapidly grow your network for an event or a job search. And two quick comments that I'll make. Um, one is the power of the alumni network, again, I think can come into play there, not just from school sustainability, but you know, even if you find employers on there who did their undergraduate work at ASU, that is still a connection that is worth exploiting. And to, to Jana's point, that's something that you can very briefly put in your outreach to them to say, hey, I'm you know, in the School of Sustainability at ASU. I see that you have an ASU connection as well uh, because usually that works and it opens a lot of doors. Second point is just, this is such a vast, powerful, complex tool. People can use it in very different ways. Uh, I honestly sort of stand in awe of the way that uh, Chris has built 2,600 connections and Jana, she didn't mention this ex explicitly today, but she has this very determined strategy of just adding five new people a day, uh, which is amazing. I mean, even when she's homesick, she's adding new people. <laughs> incredible. Uh, I, I approach LinkedIn very differently. Um, I, uh, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend this, but um, I, sort of have a rule that I impose that I will not accept any um, invitations from LinkedIn unless I actually know the person. Um, and that could be because I can, I've been at a conference with them or they're in a class or they've got some direct connection to me simply because I sort of separate out my social media. And so I, I've got sort of one network that's all LinkedIn. I've got one that's all Facebook. I've got one that's, that's Twitter or Instagram. Um, I probably, if I had it to do over again, I probably wouldn't have done it that way. Uh, but the point here is simply, there's a lot of different ways you can use it and you can use the settings to your advantage to do whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, and I think that the, the networking building strategies that, that you're hearing here are very impressive and are really worth considering. Yeah. One of the reasons why I have a large network is I think many of you know, I've tried to build the field of sustainability. So I'm trying to get in connection with as many people as possible across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to create the, the mass, right, that we need, the mass of people that we need to try to move the needle forward. So in my case, I'm not looking for a job, but I'm using the tool in very different ways uh, to primarily for that purpose, to uh, try to find ways to get like-minded people to really move sustainability forward. Yeah, so the people you're looking for are those facilitators, those help, those helpers, those people with the broad network um, that can assist you. Um, Joe, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, the privacy settings, and we did talk in our previous conversation about when you might want to adjust your privacy settings if you're looking at a lot of people yeah. in the same company. Yeah, let's say you had targeted a company. Maybe you saw a job posted from them, or maybe you just sort of read about the company. And you thought, man, that sounds like a really interesting company. I'd be, I'd be curious to find out more. So you go onto LinkedIn, you find somebody who works in marketing in that company, and then that little column pops up with other people that you may want to know. And if you start to click on all of them, if you have not adjusted your privacy settings, uh, there's sort of a fine line between doing research and showing interest and and cyber stalking. And so as an employer, it depends on the size of my company. I might not even be aware that that's going on if it's a big enough company or if HR is handling all of the, the search. 
But for me, even when I was running marketing at Sprouts, let's say, I was handling all this myself. I mean, I was looking at every job candidate. I was looking at every resume that came in. And if I had noticed that there was somebody who was just like, you know, reaching out with a, with a connection request to every single person in my company, I might react a little negatively to that and think, well, this person is kind of being a little too aggressive. Maybe that's not the kind of personality that I'm trying to hire for here. Uh, so I would just be cognizant of where, what your privacy settings are there and how you're using it. Uh, I have a, another friend who's a CEO uh, who takes exactly the reverse attitude. And he says every time somebody, he, he notices that somebody has looked at his profile, he reaches out to connect to them immediately because he figures that's sort of his, you know, his best way to build a, a hiring network. Uh, so just just be aware of your privacy settings more so in LinkedIn that you might than you might be in some other social media platforms. And I'm going to offer a counterpoint to this because I think it's such an interesting um, topic and idea, and I think it's really valuable to have Joe's perspective as someone who is recruiting. And so I do think that there is kind of a superficiality to, if you start adding 15 people at a big company and then you don't actually know all of them. It might appear like, oh, this person knows all these 15 people. How? And then it would come out like. Other just reaching out. But I also don't think there's much of a too much of a problem there. Um, cyber stalking to me is like, I saw you play soccer. Let's connect. You know, like that would be a little like, did you find that on Instagram? Come back to LinkedIn and say, oh, I see you play soccer. Let's connect um, if it's like out of context. But I have a great story I want to share with everyone. I um, I do add five people every day. I send five requests every day, more or less. Uh, and and usually it's something along the lines of I'm reading about gardens today. I go and find five people that are working in um, urban development or gardens or something like that. And I, I add them and say, especially if they have a few mutual connections with us in, at ASU, I say I'm just um, it's inspired by your work and looking forward to following along here and just leave it at that. And there was one day when I did this for oceans because I wanted to be a marine biologist when I was a kid. And I went to a small company that only has six employees and I added all of them in the same day. And um, one of them was like, let's talk. And uh, and then the Zoom opens when we sent this mess, like uh, we did a little cold call, like let's do a Zoom. And she looked like my twin. Like she looked, we were wearing the same sweater and we had the same face. And it was just like this, what? <laughs> you know? And so we connected really easily. And now we like talk a few times a year. And every time I go out to New York, I meet people from that company and, um, and it's just been kind of magical. And the original reason I reached out was feeling nostalgic for my childhood self and looking for a partner for my class for the spring. And I was hoping that that company might be the partner for that class. So I added everyone at once. Now, cut to a year later, like tomorrow I have a meeting with, with someone else at that company that is the only person from the company I haven't personally met yet. And it's been a year of a long game of just like, hey, cool organization, cool company, added everyone. No one thought it was creepy. Everyone thought it was really inspiring, wanted to learn more about what was going on at ASU. So I think um, as long as you're not, your first connection is, I'm looking for a job and you just started there, let's talk. I think it's more like, I'm inspired by your work and looking forward to following it. There's nothing wrong with adding a bunch of people. And then I also like link to people's profiles all the time. So if you see that I was on your profile, it could be that I was sending your name to someone for an opportunity. It's not that I was like, what student doing today, you know, stalking you. So I think there's lots of different ways to see it. And there, um, there's good points that you don't want to just like blanket add people with no intention and look like you're chasing down an entire company and being a little aggressive. But if you are because you're excited about the work, I don't see a big problem there. And, and it's just growing your network so that you're curating what you're consuming, including educational materials from their company. And they're probably excited about that. You might find your doppelganger, apparently. I mean, it was freaky, y'all. We were wearing the same sweater. We have the same cheeks. Um, her 90-year-old father lives in Arizona. We might meet someday when she comes out for a holiday. Like, it's just been great. And when I went to New York Climate Week, you know, I emailed her. I, didn't, I haven't met her in person yet, but I've met the other people at the company multiple times and got invited to a really cool event because of them. So it just like, uh, there are lots of goals. And so you don't have to feel like you're doing something uncomfortable if your goal is just to consume knowledge and get to know people um i think it's totally fine to add people you don't know and i think that in the past we really wanted it to be first connections so that you could make connections to genuine people that you knew but now it's becoming more of a, an educational platform where the follow and the connect are, are similar and um so i think it's it's just good to try it and see how it feels 
Yeah, I think that that is that keys into one of the questions that a lot of people asked when they made the RSVP is how do I cold contact somebody if it's a company I'm interested in, but I don't know anybody there. And I think they've given you some really good strategies for doing that. Just, you know, say I'm interested in following your work at first or, you know, finding that in or just sending it. I, I mean, people will have different responses. But the worst that can happen is they'll just deny your connection and then you'll move on to the next person. Like no one's gonna, hopefully. <laughs> and you will never find, you won't, yeah. they won't send you a message if someone's denied, by the way. So I, I don't think I've ever received a no. message saying someone's denied my connection request. I've probably had some denied. Yeah. So you forget about it too, which is. You know. Yeah, you just move on. But I think it's it's like many things where it just gets easier the more times you do it. And then eventually you're just tick, 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 tick. Like, it'll be like, you might know all these people. And you're like, sure. <laughs> and, and you can go from there. Um, how important is it for somebody to send uh, uh, something personal in when they do connect you as a cold connection? Uh, for me, yeah. I mean, uh, if somebody has not taken the time or made the, a modicum of effort to, to understand who I am or what my background is or what our common interests are, I will not pay attention to it. I will just ignore it. Uh, but I like Jenna's strategy on that. I mean, I think if somebody reaches out to me and says in genuine language, hey, I'm inspired by what I've seen about you or I read this article that you wrote or I read your book or you know whatever it is, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's plenty for me to be able to get me hooked into a conversation. The other thing I do is look at mutual connections. So if I have 500 mutual connections, chances are that person is probably going to have something relevant to mm. the work that I'm interested mm -hmm. in. Um, and, and then of course, I'll also go look at the profile. So I get requests all the time from people who want to be my executive coach. I don't want an executive <laughs> coach. So take the time <laughs> to actually look at their profile and see what might be motivating um, their reaching out to you. Yep, I always accept a request from students. If you're someone who doesn't have much of a, a following, you should be adding all of your friends, all of your professors, everyone you've met at ASU, um, because you exist here in this group. And then I just put three examples of like my most recent outreach messages. So Lynn, I'm enjoying your session at the Swissy event this morning, looking forward to connecting and following your updates on LinkedIn. She replied, thank you, Jana. Um, Al, I really appreciate the question you asked in the EFAB meeting this morning. Um, and looking forward to connecting and following your updates on LinkedIn. He was like, thank you. Uh, last night, Sarah, I'm reading this article with this title that cites you, wishing you well in your support of your community. I look forward to connecting and following along on LinkedIn. Like, that's it. So it's just connecting and following along. And then there's no ask. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, so we are going to move on from our part of the presentations. I have some ready, but we are much more interested in ones that you might have on chat or in the room. Yes. Um, it seems like a lot of your um, examples come from the academic sector or from the private sector, but I'm curious how you, if you have insights on using LinkedIn, if you're looking for a job with the government or in, um, at a nonprofit or just other types of jobs. So if those on the call didn't hear that, she's asking about using LinkedIn to connect for jobs more related to working for the government or for nonprofits. Yeah, well, you know Ed Chu. Mm -hmm. Ed, Ed Chu has been with us from the EPA. He's probably one of the most prolific LinkedIn users that I know of. So yeah, it's it's not exclusive to the academic and private sector. So I have people from, from nonprofit organizations, also from the public sector. Um, some people from the public sector might be there might be more rules around what they're able to do um, because they are federal or state employees. So there might be some restrictions on the kinds of activities that, that they can undertake. So that's my, but why you might see fewer people from, especially the public sector, nonprofit. I think I see, I have lots of connections that are with nonprofit organizations. Yeah. And I, I would add just briefly to that, that sometimes I think, uh, for, for government jobs, and it's also true for, for private sector jobs, but there's often a requirement of posting the job somewhere, even though they know they're going to fill the job internally. Uh, and so you will see 
a lot of jobs uh, that get posted online, including on LinkedIn, that you can apply all you want, uh, but they already know who they're hiring. And I, I do think that happens sometimes with some of those government positions too. And a couple questions online. Oh, oh can I just jump in real quick? Sure. I would just um, say like kind of similar to what they said, but use it in the same way that you would for any kind of role, just keeping in mind like for government or other things that they probably aren't hiring in the same way. Like even here at ASU, like I can't do anything. You got to apply and go through the system. Like I appreciate that, but you can still network with them. You can still, you know, connect with them and find out what it's like to work at that type of organization. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of alumni that are working in uh, federal roles. I'm sure would be happy to talk to you about what that looks like. And then also regarding Ed2, if you sign up for your newsletter, you'll find this out. We are working on a visit with EPA. EPA is planning on coming here on November 7th. I haven't been able to put it out yet because I'm still working on getting a room and a time, but they are coming. They want to talk to students. They want to recruit for summer internships, which open in November. Um, and they'll talk about jobs as well. So thank you for mentioning that. That is something I would like for you to keep on your radar because you just mentioned federal jobs and everyone else that wants to so come find out boss, more about it. Let's do it. Your boss, as you know, runs those workshops every year on usajobs.gov, yeah. right? Yeah, Have you been to any of those? What? Have you been to any of those? Yeah, 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 of okay. course. I just wanted to open the discussion. Okay, good. Yeah. Jobs. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that session on how to land a federal job mm -hmm. uh, is next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. so. And I'll just reiterate that um, like lots of people use LinkedIn and it's kind of a similar philosophy for whoever you want to be following. So let's say you want to work um, at the EPA, you can then look at who's on LinkedIn at EPA, you can start liking their content, you can start reaching out to them. I have tons of people from nonprofits and I can see, you can see the metrics of who's engaging with your posts and most often it's founders and then you can see the size of the company and most often it's like five to ten. So like you can just kind of make your audience who you want it to be and you can um, you can go and reach out to a bunch of people from different companies and connect with them the same way you would if you were doing this for academic reasons. And when you do that, then they start posting jobs. I actually think that like I, I intentionally like jobs that I think our students would like. And the more um, I like posts from nonprofits, the more jobs I'm seeing at nonprofits and you don't actually would might not necessarily find them by searching for them the same way that you'll get this curated feed of jobs from people from nonprofits that you think are cool. And that way you can reduce some of the noise of the nonprofits or um, for profits that you might not want to work with. And you see a more curated feed of like Jane Goodall Institute or whatever it is that you're looking for. So um, I think it's great. I'd love to answer the question about what to post about that Jillian asked in the chat. Can, can I do that? Yes. So Jill uh -huh. That's Jillian asked, how important is your feed? I've never posted or reposted anything. Should I somehow make posts about my past roles, accomplishments, events attended, educational and professional building seminars, um, or just start fresh? And I think this is such a good question. Um, so it goes back to like, uh, your voice and what you want to post about. So a lot of really engaging posts include like just attended this event, three takeaways are. So if you wanted to start today, you could be like, just went to how to LinkedIn with some professors and staff at ASU. And one takeaway is just start somewhere. And then that's your first post, you know, um, or whatever it is. But I see a lot of people going to conferences and saying three big takeaways with a selfie of them at the conference. And that's a great post or um, just got this award or just finished this class, loved writing this paper. I always do a first day of school post of what I'm working on this semester. Um, so those are easy, like uh, I'm comfortable explaining that this is what I'm working on posts. I also think when you're reposting something, posting it with a comment on it. And so you can just repost and then people like it and that's fine. And it signals what you care about. But if you repost with comment and make one sentence, like a observation about the reading, mm -hmm then you've just done another kind of post that people might find um, useful to them in their network. And then I don't know that you have to go back into the archives of past accomplishments on your resume unless you really want to. But one of my parts of my personal brand is why I do what I do. And so I do like when I was a kid, I wanted to be kind of posts or lessons I've learned in my journey so far kind of posts. And that's because I use it as an educational tool and my biggest audience are students at ASU. So I like to share learning that I've had in the in my career so far, and it's just part of my personal brand. So I think you could say like coming up on graduation, three of the top um, highlights of my journey at ASU so far have been or something like that. 
Um, and then, and they like posts with pictures, the algorithm enjoys those. So if you have a picture of you out in the desert or whatever it is, um, people usually kind of slow down when they see those. Now, people pay attention to human faces. And there's probably something evolutionary in all of this. So if you can put a picture of yourself or other human being, people tend to gravitate to those more than just generic images. A couple other questions online. Mm -hmm. If we can get some quick answers. Uh, in terms of entry-level searching, any tips for an out-of-state individual? So if you're searching for a job that would be in a new state, do you have any tips? Well, you can, you can search for jobs by state, right? Start with that. And you can also search your contacts by state or even by location. You can search your contacts by, by cities. So if you're looking for a job in another state, I would start by looking to see if you have any contacts that are actually in state or nearby, in addition to obviously being subject matter experts as well. Caroline? The other thing I would add, I was reading a book recently and I can grab some of the tips from there, but they were like, you can just say, like you can set your location to the set. Like if you know I'm gonna be moving to Portland or something like that, put your location as Portland. Um, you're allowed to do that. There's no rules that say that you can't. And that will also help, you know, if you're connected uh, more locally to things in that area. So that's something that you can do too. And now if you don't know the location, then yeah, you're gonna be doing you know, more narrowing in or searching or something like that, but you can do that. I think my big advice would be if you're applying for something that's in another state, in your cover letter, say, I am already planning to move to this state. Uh, and so they're not like, okay, well, we have to make an offer and then they have to decide if they're going to move and then this and this and this. If you say, I am already moving to this state and I plan to do so like within the next two months or something like that, then you've kind of reassured them that you will be available if you're the person they hire. And they don't have to pay your relocation costs. Yeah. Right? yeah. Right. yeah. Right. I, I've even taken that to the next mm -hmm. step where if I've had some contact with an organization, but it seems to have stalled out, I will sometimes write to them and say, I'm going to be in your area, even though I have no plans to be in their area. You know, <laughs> two weeks from Thursday, would love to get together and talk about this. Because again, it just you're eliminating every excuse that they could give for why they're not going to pursue this. Make it easy for them. All right. We have another one from online. We do. So like many students, I'm using my new degree to initiate a career change. What is a good way to market yourself when your previous work experience doesn't necessarily speak to the positions you're interested in, but maybe your degree does help regarding newly acquired skills? Well, my number one answer to that is passion. Uh, I think in, in so many industries, particularly related to sustainability, there aren't a lot of applicable job skills from, from anywhere, you know, uh, maybe a little bit from, from school, but not from past jobs. What matters is passion. If you can demonstrate to a prospective employer that you've got that fire in the belly that you understand that we have a common enemy out there and it's 1.5 degrees Celsius or whatever you wanna, however you wanna position it, that's the sort of thing that really resonates because they won't fixate on your past jobs, your past skills. What they will fixate on is how you can make a contribution to the culture of that company. And that includes the posts that you're making. So this is why it's so important to start mm -hmm. posting because your persona will be defined not by the degree letters after your name or even your major. It'll be defined by the kinds of things that you're posting about on LinkedIn. And I find that sustainability students often resist the idea of personal branding as something that's very corporate um, or inauthentic, but it is really important, especially if you're going to make that kind of transition, because it's really important to build that personal brand as someone who is passionate about this, has expertise in it, knows the language of the field, um, all of those kinds of things kind of demonstrate that expertise. And Caroline. Uh, yes, just wanted to add, curate your content on your um, LinkedIn. So don't just like add your degree and all your other stuff that you had before, but curate your headline, curate your summary, use keywords that are applicable to the field that you're moving into. Like you can change all that stuff and you can really frame it. Like even if you've got a lot of experience in that space, 
you can use those keywords, what you learned, how you want to apply it, um, follow the groups associated with uh, the career change that you're looking to make, make the connections with people in the field that you're looking to move into. And in your prior experience, maybe frame the skills and experience that you had in terms of, uh, you know, how it applies to the thing that you're looking for. If you have professional experience, if you have project management, if you have a finance background, like I don't know what your background is, maybe dance would be harder to like apply, but mostly any other professional role that you have can apply to, you know, this other role. So just think about it in that way, how you can say, okay, yeah, I was doing project management, but you know, frame it for sustainability. Caroline, question. So if, a, if we have current students or alumni who are trying to move in a different direction or have identified a key role, can they come to Career Services and ask, can you look over my LinkedIn profile? Yes, absolutely. Okay. We work with alumni as well as current students. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And I highly encourage it. Even if you know exactly what you're doing, it's 30 minutes. Let us look at your LinkedIn. I guarantee <laughs> you will have something to say about it. Same thing with your resume um, or anything else. You're looking for connections, all that stuff. Um, yeah. We only have a couple minutes left, so I'm hoping this would be a quick one. This is one that people asked in advance. What keywords are best to look for on LinkedIn if you're looking for sustainability jobs? Sustainability would be one. <laughs> There's 25,000 jobs. If you go on right now and type in sustainability, you'll see 25,000 positions. That's pretty good. How do you point. narrow that down? Well, then you can put sustainability and food or sustainability and energy or sustainability and... And of course, you can actually look by sector as well. There's all kinds of filters that you could use. You can search for entry-level positions. We did that in class, right? Unfortunately, entry-level positions means two years of experience. But we also just had one of our alumni visit, Danielle Vermeer, saying that there's ways that you can demonstrate experience through internships or other mm -hmm. things that you've done. So it doesn't necessarily mean you need to have had a full-time job for two years. So anyway, there's lots of filters out there that you can... Yes, Caroline. Sorry, I have so much to say. <laughs> I can't stop. I do want to encourage you to just move beyond that one word, though, because I do know a lot of students feel like overwhelmed or something like that. If you just type in sustain any sustainability job, you know, you're going to get a lot of hits and it's not going to feel focused. And you can definitely do that, but use some of those other keywords. So what are you interested in sustainability? So is that food systems? Is it nonprofit? Is it community development? Is it environment, conservation, like those are the types of words that you want to start using and playing around with. If you find jobs that you're interested in, grab the wording from those jobs yeah. and pull out the keywords. You're going to see a lot of those recurring type of keywords that I think will be helpful for you. The other one thing I do want to mention is consider sustainability roles at organizations that might not be sustainability focused on the surface. Don't miss those opportunities. If you're only like, I want sustainability at Whole Foods or I want sustainability at Patagonia, that's cool. But remember, like literally every other job is like needs something and they might not call it sustainability. They might call it project manager or community outreach coordinator. If it doesn't have sustainability in the title, you still want, you don't want to miss out on those opportunities. So yeah, couldn't agree more. I, I think sustainability jobs lurk in some unusual places mm -hmm. in companies. We've talked about Sprouts a little bit. Sustainability exists in the legal department mm -hmm. at Sprouts mm -hmm. for just weird historical reasons, but yeah. that's where it is. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's in the CEO's uh, suite. Sometimes it's in marketing. Sometimes it is its own vertical, uh, but you, you should be clever and flexible in trying to figure out what the function of the role is, and not so much what the title is, because you know what? AI is working its way through LinkedIn right now, and it's going to help the employers and LinkedIn figure out what you're interested in, even if there isn't a direct hit on the keyword. So if you can figure out what the functions are and the you know, you want to be involved in environmental problem solving. <coughs> you want to be involved in, although I wouldn't use the, the the words diversity, equity, inclusion right now, because a lot of companies are trying to run in the other direction from that, but the functions are still there. Uh, so if you can figure out what those things are and search under that, AI is going to help direct you to the right kinds of 
All right. Well, that is our time. So I wanted to thank everyone online and everyone here for attending. And I especially want to thank our three panelists, uh, Joe, Chris, and Jana. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think all of you understand the assignment now, right? Which is to connect, connect. to Joe, Chris, <laughs> and Jana. And um, Ivy and Lindsay and everyone, Caroline. Yeah. Um, work in the School of Business and the School of Engineering, and I have a bunch of their alumni in my network. So you never know where those kinds of connections are going to come from. So yeah, add all of us. And um, we will follow up with an email about how you can get on the Career Services um, email list. And I'll also probably ask you for some feedback on this session. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you on LinkedIn. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.